I remember very well the day that Pearl Harbor was attacked. It was a Sunday morning, and uh, I just visited my friend who lived about a half mile from me. I worked at a hospital, so I was in the hospital room. We had just come home from church and uh, starting to get ready for lunch, and uh, wham, we, my dad came in and said, Pearl Harbor's been attacked. World War II proved to be the pivotal event of the 20th century. On the battlefield and at home, the impact of the war was immense. It created indelible memories in each person it touched, and it touched just about everyone. It affected their lives forever. They gave up their boyhood. They gave up all they had for that war. My best memories were meeting so many people from all over, all over, from most every state in the Union, to find out that people are the same mostly everywhere. The next second, somebody could kill you. And of course, when there's artillery going all around and mortars and all that other kind of stuff, and you just wonder, is the next one coming over? Is that got my name on it? There's so many people that don't have, don't have a clue what we're talking about. They just, gee, that must have been something. Yeah, it was really something, all right, that's for sure. Yep. Funding for Oregon Experience is provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Ann and Bill Swindell's Charitable Trust, the Oregon Cultural Trust, and from viewers like you. Thank you. Are the uh, Japanese going to come on over and invade the U.S.? Because this might just occur the, uh, the way they had hit Pearl Harbor. Uh, with practically no defense, uh, they could come right straight onto the California or Oregon coast. Immediately after Pearl Harbor, uh, many of the families uh, had visitors of men in black suits, and they were the FBI. My dad worked in an importing-exporting store, and of course, when they went to work on Monday morning, the FBI was were standing right there. And they arrested the owner and, uh, of the store Im immediately. And, but the, some of the employees were allowed to come home at the end of three days. So when he got home, he thought, oh, well, they still might c come after me. So uh, I'll be ready. And so he packed his little suitcase and he just left it by the front door. They never did come after him. So he got the idea, oh, I'm not important <laughs> enough to be uh, arrested. And it may have uh, uh, punctured his ego a, a little bit. But uh, in the case of a lot of families, I think it ended up about 70 or 80 fathers were picked up by the FBI. He, the mothers and the kids never knew why their fathers uh, were arrested. No reason was ever given. Within weeks of Pearl Harbor, several coastal towns organized citizen militias, patrolling the beaches and training to repel or at least slow down a Japanese attack. Schoolboys built model airplanes to help sky watchers identify enemy aircraft. People in Portland and other cities practice blackouts and air raid drills. 
families learned how to neutralize any firebombs that might land in their homes. Frank Gehrman had joined the National Guard months before war broke out. Well, they told me if I'd volunteer, I could pick my place where I wanted to go. So I said, well, I want the engineers. I've been driving the cat, so I'd like to go help build airstrips or something for the Army. And they, they didn't give it to me. And the old major in the medics, he says it was all hand-picked, every one of us. And I think what he done, he got most of us were farm boys. I think he figured we could stand blood. And so, anyway, I got in the medics, and I didn't want that. I didn't want the medics at all. His battalion deployed to New Guinea, where the Japanese had established air bases. So we walked all from one end of New Guinea to the other because it was all swamps. You couldn't drive anything up that way. Well, it was awful. We had one big mountain there. They called it Roosevelt Ridge. They fought for 76 days to take this one mountain. And then was Bayak Island, a little island that had a good airstrip on it. And we took it. That's the worst battle we had is Bayak. And we had a guy fighting rear guard for us. He had a machine gun, a little air-cooled machine gun. And he burned up a barrel shooting at the Japs. They said that he had them piled three deep in the road coming down at us. And the biggest wound that we had that day was our own Navy. They called the Navy in to shell this ridge. And they were supposed to shell the third ridge. And they didn't do it. They got down on the second ridge. And that's where we was dug in our second battalion. But according to my count, we had 60 dead people that day. As a medic, Frank treated plenty of malaria and other tropical sicknesses, as well as every sort of war injury. He also tended to wounded prisoners. They brought them into the aid station. We took care of them. So I was given one of them a chocolate bar and he was eating it. The infantry guys that brought him in was mad and said, you feeding them so and so? And I said, if you don't want me to feed them, don't bring them in here. I says, we got to take care of them too. I says, same as you guys. If they bring you, bring in a wounded guy, we'll take care of them. And so we did. And we took care of quite a few of them. The Japs had tunnels and they go over and come up someplace else. So it was real bad getting them. You had to get up to them tunnels and throw hand grenades into them. Flamethrowers. They brought flamethrowers in the last. They, that was, they were wicked. He saved many lives, and he ended at least one. At that time, I had a 45 pistol, and I was walking down the trail. And Pretty soon here he laid and he swings his rifle around at me and I beat him to the draw. And he was just a little old lookout, you know, out there ahead of the guys. And so when I shot him, that's the only one I ever shot at, but I got him with the 45 pistol. So then they started opening up with machine guns. Frank Gehrman often risked enemy fire to retrieve wounded comrades. For this, he was awarded the Army's Distinguished Service Cross for extraordinary heroism. Okay, step up. Yes, dear. The United States entered the war with an active cavalry. The Army had procured a number of its horses from the wild herds of Eastern Oregon, where Horace Durfee buckarooed. 1939, there was a big call for army horses, you know, and I got a job breaking horses. It was a big push uh, to get cavalry horses, and those old cavalry officers 
thought they were going to win the war with the cavalry. Even we knew that, us old boys out there in the corrals, you know, <laughs> that we couldn't win the war with the cavalry. But they was paying us pretty good money, probably the best money I'd ever made, you know. And uh, so we just kept our mouths shut and just kept going. By 1943, the Army had terminated most of its horse programs. They said the cavalry had 42,000 head of horses at that time, the government did for the Army. That's a few horses. I always wondered what they'd done with them after the war. And uh, I never really knew till years later. After the war, Horace tracked down one of the Fort Riley officers. He says there was nine killing plants in Canada. He says, I was in charge, we shipped all, we shipped 29,000 head of horses to Canada and they were butchered, pickled in barrels, and they were shipped to the lowlands of Europe and that's what they fed those people on after the war. Carl Costell of Baker City joined the National Guard in 1938. He had planned to serve just one year of active duty. The war broke out. This made a big difference. Baker had some real early casualties in the war. We had three boys killed at Pearl Harbor from Baker. One's my class, class in school, another class ahead of me. And we had three boys on the Baton Death March, and only one of them survived that. So you had some incentive. You need to get even with those dirty so-and-sos. He enlisted in the Air Force and entered pilot training. When I graduated uh, and went through uh, training, uh, I was sent to China flying B-25s. The people that were in the squadron were farm boys, just like me, just young kids that, that had a little training. And here we'd have a tough mission assigned to us and maybe sounded might, like it might be a little hairy and all these fellows just sucked it up and one did the mission. That always impressed me about being a member of a group like that. Most people don't know why, why we're in China, and they still don't know. The reason we were there is to try to keep China in the war. As long as we kept China in the war, Japan had to have anywhere from one to two million soldiers in China. And so those were soldiers that couldn't go down in the South Pacific or any place else. Carl went on to fly 38 missions. We'd go out to sea and, and try to get some shipping. And we'd go down and support uh, Chinese troops. I had the misfortune of a a very bad hit from an anti-aircraft shell, and we had to bail out almost right over the target, which was 200 miles behind the lines. I delayed my opening because I didn't want to get shot at in the air. And uh, so I was watching the ground come up. I'd never had a parachute jump. They used to have, that's part of your training in the cadet program, but they stopped because they were getting too many broken ankles. So I saw my plane hit the ground. All of a sudden, the ground was coming up so fast that I jerked the cord and was just, just had time to reach up and grab my shrouds, and I was on the ground. The Air Force notified Carl's family that he was missing in action. He had, in fact, been rescued by Chinese guerrilla soldiers. They got $500 in, in American funds. We called it gold in those days for each flyer they brought out from behind the lines. And that was an absolute fortune in, in those days. The guerrillas live off the land. And we'd make some miles and uh, wind up in a little village and they'd just rustle up some food. I spent a month getting back from that. There was a regulation in the 14th Air Force that if you'd been behind the enemy lines, you were not permitted to fly anymore. That was the end of my combat flying. What next? Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles? Perhaps. So the Japs think, but a great America is now aroused. The reason that they gave for evacuating us 
was uh, for military reasons, that the whole West Coast was a militarily strategic zone and uh, that General DeWitt, who was in charge, uh, insisted that all persons of Japanese ancestry be removed from this zone. And his attitude was, uh, a Jap is a Jap. Uh, it doesn't matter if he's an American citizen. If he has Japanese blood, uh, then he's an enemy. And he came out and said this openly. And when they were trying to decide, should they evacuate all persons of Japanese ancestry? One of the few voices that said, no, it's not necessary, was J. Edgar Hoover. And uh, he was against evacuation because he knew there was nothing going on uh, in the Japanese community. By May 5, all of the families living in Portland were required to uh, report to the, what we call the Portland Assembly Center. Uh, and that's where the Expo Center is today. And at that time, the Expo Center was the stockyards. And so they had to convert the stockyards into living quarters. It accommodated about 3,500 people. My father came here to Portland in 1897, and my mother came in 1917. May Ninomiya was 23 when the evacuation plans were announced. I kept thinking, since my brothers and I, we were citizens, we were born here, I said, we won't have to go. We were citizens, so why would they put citizens into camp, I said. Oh, no, I was mistaken. We just had to pack and do what we were ordered to do. Our cubicle was just the right size for five canvas army cots. And there was no door to the cubicle. And you can hear everything coming over the walls. And when you're about 15, you're very adaptable. And so I wasn't complaining too much, except uh, one day, it was a hot day. So I made my way out to the north side of the building where the shade was. So I was sitting on the dirt ground, leaning against the building when somebody hollered, hey, George. And I looked up and there was a car passing by uh, on the road. And from the back window of the car was my old friend, Evan. But all I had time to say was, hi, Evan. And uh, the car went down the road. And just at that moment, my eyes focused on the barbed wire fence between us. And uh, it, it, it hit me for the first time that uh, we're in kind of a bad predicament. The families were confined to the Portland Assembly Center for about four months, awaiting construction of the internment camps. May's family was then sent to Idaho. Minidoka, Hunt, Idaho is where the place was. And they got these army barracks and had them all in a row. It was uh, isolated, it was barren country, and, and the wind would just blow, and all these sagebrush came tumbling all over the place. Nothing grew at that time, but after we were there, uh, the people began to um, grow uh, little garden plots right by their barracks, and they grew vegetables and flowers. They had some beautiful flowers blooming after a few months that we were there. In Oregon and throughout the U.S., wartime meant shortages of almost everything. We had a hard time getting tires for logging trucks and for automobiles of all kinds. Bill Hagenstein worked for the West Coast Lumbermen's Association. Anything that was made with metal uh, became in tight supply because so much of it was going off for the use of the military during the war. In nearly every town, Oregonian salvaged scrap metal, paper, and rubber. 
the citizens of Baker City donated more than just scrap to the war effort. When I was a Civil War cannon, this one of these big round tubes about like this, solid metal, you know, mounted. And uh, during the war effort, of course, they, they needed scrap iron real bad. So somebody or some buddies got real patriotic here and decided we ought to give her cannon to the war effort. Well, they did. And, of course, uh, after it was gone and after the war was over, well, then they wished they hadn't given away. People collected bacon grease for the war. They drove less walked more, carpooled, and cut back on electricity. World War II spawned some of the most successful conservation and recycling in U.S. history. Gas was rationed. Food was rationed. Each person had an allotment of rationed stamps. And one of the big problems was that getting enough meat. Meat was rationed. And one of the uh, recommendations of the U.S. Department of Agriculture was feed the loggers more peanut butter. Well, hell, uh, loggers like peanut butter all right, but uh, they like meat a lot better. So they sent a, uh, they sent a doctor, Dr. Auchter, I remember his name, A-U-C-H-T-E-R, who was a, a medical doctor, but he was a nutrition expert. And they sent him out here, and they gave me the job of taking him out into a logging camp where he spent a week. And he, they fitted him up with, with the loggers' uh, cork shoes, and, and he went out where they were still falling timber by hand with their four and a half pound axes, their nine foot falling saws and whatnot. And uh, he made a report that uh, forget the peanut butter and get the meat for them. And they got extra re meat rations for all the men that worked in the woods. Everybody thought he was a great guy. If they had ever, ever given anybody a medal, he would have received it. <laughs> Health education flourished. Victory Garden programs urged families to grow their own. I helped in the garden with my dad, almost an acre of it, and then we shared it with people that didn't have gardens too, you know. And my dad had some honeybees, and sugar was rationed, so he had a lot of people that he kept in honey. You know, that was a good thing. Where wartime industries were in full swing, housing was in short supply. Places to rent became especially scarce around military bases. I don't think there was a week went by there for three or four years that some young woman wasn't knocking on the door wanting to know if in this great big house, you might have an empty room. It was, it was bad. I knew one young woman whose husband was a, an officer that just by accident managed to rent a motel room. It was a room and bath. And she had put a hot plate in the corner and a coffee pot. And she paid me 35 cents an hour to do her housework. Well, I'd sweep the floor and I'd dust everything and take me about 20 minutes and she'd pay me for a couple of hours just so she'd have somebody to talk to. She didn't know a soul, but he might get a chance to get off on the weekend, so there she sat. Phil Levesque joined the Army fresh out of college. He was assigned to an infantry unit on the front lines in Luxembourg. I was in a section of six privates and a sergeant it was called the intelligence section, and when I first heard about that, I said, well, I, th I think I'm fairly intelligent and maybe I'm in the right place. I, so I asked my first sergeant, what will I be doing? Uh, you will be a scout and a point man and a forward observer. And I says, oh man, that's all she wrote. I ain't coming home. You know that you're in the crosshairs of a German someplace. You just, you just know you are. And, and there's no way that you can really get used to this and say, this is gonna be okay. 
We were going from one small town to another. The Germans had artillery at this town where we were. And so somebody decided that they were going to send the infantry out for this artillery piece. So they started across this 100-yard field. Well, they didn't know it at the time. They knew there's an artillery piece ahead of them someplace. But, but there was a, a, a machine gun with two German um, Hitler youth behind the machine gun. And they got out about, uh, I guess, about 30 yards out into this field. And the, the Hitler youth uh, cut loose with the machine gun. And ahead of these guys, about 20 yards, it looked like a ditch. And so they all, the survivors of this first machine gun, ran for this ditch t for, for some, some cover and so forth. The Germans had a machine gun at the end of the ditch. So they got the whole bunch of them along this ditch line. And so they probably lost at least 20 of 30 men just like that in a matter of five or 10 minutes, something like that. The name of the game was, it can't get any worse than this. Well, that was not true either, but it, it got worse. It got worse than that later on. Back home, many products were hard to get. But production itself, everything from agriculture to industry, was booming. The cities, especially Portland, grew and prospered. People that lived in, out in eastern Oregon would come in to Portland and get a job at the shipyards, and they truly knew they'd be hired because they needed help. And uh, otherwise, they would never have done that. A lot of loggers were, were taken out of the woods and, and went into the shipyards and went into the aircraft factories because uh, first place, you're, out, you're not living out in the woods in a logging camp. You're close to the bright lights and the girls, you're in town. So there was a big drain of men. And of course, uh, the wages were probably superior to what the men were actually getting in the woods. Farmers contracted workers from Mexico for many agricultural jobs. Some communities had never seen Hispanic workers in the fields. And they were bringing them in by the train loads to harvest the hops because there weren't any hop people anymore. They were all doing something like build ships and uh, making a lot more money. The war altered everyday life just about everywhere. School was quite different because we lost teachers. The band teacher was off to war. We had a science teacher that went to war. And uh, many of the classes were small because the boys were enlisting. There wasn't many boys. They soon disappeared. You know, you couldn't take any foreign languages. There's no foreign language teachers. And I wanted to become a teacher Gas would not permit us driving over to Southern Oregon College, where I would have went. And uh, so I put that aside. I had a, a friend here in Baker. His name was Harold Sherrod, and he says, we can go down to Portland, the shipyards, and make $1.20 an hour. And we took off for Portland and went to work. The three shipyards in Portland and Vancouver built more than 700 vessels during the war. One interesting thing there, they decided they wanted to make a record building a ship. So they, they called it the hot ship. They was going to build it in 10 days. So they uh, picked the best crews, and our crew happened to get picked. I was working day shift, and then swing shift come on, and then the night crew, golly, when you come back the next morning, you know, it had advanced so far, it did not recognize it anymore. <laughs> and we built that Liberty ship in 10 days. And then immediately, well, they'd bring in the steel and would start a new one. Women were joining the military and medical services in record numbers. And on the home front, women now worked at traditionally male jobs. 
Women had opportunities that never would have ever happened if it hadn't have been for World War II. For instance, I have a girlfriend in Molala who was a uh, electrician at the shipyards, and she did all the wiring in the boats, she and her crew. They had uh, opportunities to have job levels that, well, of course, they never probably would have had a job. And there was gals that uh, crawled in the bellies of the big bombers and wired down there because men didn't fit. There was no men to take those jobs. They wouldn't have happened. The planes wouldn't have got made, neither would the ships. Cherry Hendricks came from Birmingham, Alabama. I had a relative that lived in Portland and had worked in the shipyard. He wrote me a letter and told me the opportunities that I could have if I come out here. My job first was cleaning, cleaning. I did more of that than anything, but I did do a welding also, a little welding. I had never been on a great big ship or nothing, and I, we had to walk across the, the gangplank or whatever it is, <laughs> across the water, and I, and I am afraid of water, and I was scared to death. But I know that I had to do something, so I just went across there and, and worked. Racial discrimination prevailed in the U.S., but the armed forces were less segregated than before, and African Americans now served in large numbers. Thousands of black workers came to Portland for the first time, too. Most lived in the hastily built town of Vanport. Vanport was a was really a nice place to live, clean, and a lot of people lived there, different kinds of people, but I'd never lived in a place that packed with people so close together. They had clubs and movies and everything. And I was not one of those people that liked to go out a lot into clubs and stuff. So I'm, I stayed home most of the time and went to church on Sundays and whatever other days they had services. I realized that there were still prejudices here, but I didn't have any bad experiences with people of no race. We got along just fine, especially when we were working. When I was in Alabama, we couldn't ride anywhere you wanted to sit on the bus. There were signs on the bus where they say colored. And they, people in Alabama and in other southern states, didn't have the least idea what they were doing to people of another color, because that hurt. It really hurt. And when I came here and we could get on the bus and get a seat, and nobody asked you to move. Several military facilities were situated near Klamath Falls, where Bonnie Gehrman went to high school. Mainly what I was doing was just uh, being a, a teenage girl uh, with my jaw hanging because of so many young men <laughs> were going to come to Klamath Falls. Saturday night was every night. <laughs> I would work all day and then go to the dances. And that was, you never was, you never had any rest. <laughs> there was guys flocking around and they'd cut in on the dances and everything. And that's where we learned the great jitterbug. And I was one of the most hip <laughs> as a jitterbug. We wrote to the boys. I had a whole bunch of them. I narrowed it down, though, as time went on, <laughs> to one. <laughs> we knew that we were going to go into the battle, but we didn't know where or when. 
the weather was just horrible. It was snow and freezing weather all the time. Like we were outside all the time. But we never even knew what country we were in. We didn't know what country we were in. We didn't know whether in France or Belgium or anything. Never, never told us where we were. Ed and Richard Atia are twins, born and raised in Portland with their younger brother Vic. Ed and Richard joined the Army together and served in the same company until December 1944. Their first combat experience in the brutal Battle of the Bulge would also be their last. That night we were in a forest right there and they called us out about 10 or 11 o'clock at night and with the freezing weather and they they paid us, gave us uh, Belgian money. And I, 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 to this day, I can't understand why they would pay us off the night before we we're going to go into to battle. And I still remember it was snowing and hailing, and we had no air support. And the Germans, I, I could see their 88 millimeter guns were sitting on top of the ground because they didn't have to protect them because no air support and they were hitting us with, with shrapnel into the trees and everything, which would come down in the foxhole we were in and kill a lot of people that way with the shrapnel coming down the foxhole. And we were hitting them with everything we had. They just outnumbered us so much, we just, we just like trying to kill ants. We just, we just kept just fighting and fighting and fighting, and we, we couldn't figure out where they were all coming from. You know, they just kept coming wave after wave after wave, you know. Our divisional commander said, we're gonna to have to surrender. And by then we had lost two thirds of our division, uh, either by being killed or wounded or captured. And there's only one, one regiment left of, of the three. We started breaking up all of our equipment and uh, destroying everything we possibly could. And that's when the Germans came up there, took us, took us prisoners, so. The brothers were captured at different times and sent to different camps. We were, we were crawling across this field, and the next thing we know, fire and fire was coming across at a machine gun fire and stuff like that too. And then, so I was with about maybe about ten fellows, and then all we did was pull out our handkerchiefs and wave them in the air. And then the firing finally stopped, and then we stood up and raised our hands and put our hands behind our heads. They lost contact with each other for more than six months. We were walking most of the time in the snow and the hail and the rain. And they told us that if anybody drops out, you're going to be shot. And every once in a while, people would, pay, would drop down, and all of a sudden, you hear some shots, you know, being get killed on the way back. And then they finally, they finally put us in some box cars. And the cars were just had a, they had a stack so, so, so tight in there, you couldn't sit down. Well, they were, they were cattle cars. Cattle cars, yeah. I and mean, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't stand up or anything. And we had to stand up, we had no place to sit down. As for, for some guys would die that way, they'd they just, they'd be dead standing up because we were packed in there so tight. They had us working in this open pit mine and we couldn't do much work, we were too weak. They'd have us out there all day, all day long from morning till night. Everybody was suffering from malnutrition. And in fact, we reached the point where we were losing about one or two American a day, they were just dying from malnutrition, and then we'd have we'd have funerals just constantly there for the fellows that passed away, and then uh, we, we couldn't stand up. We'd be sitting down, you couldn't you had to stand up real slow because if you tried to stand up real fast, you'd black out. All we think about was food. We'd sit there talking to other fellows there, and, and you talk about every meal you ever had. And, and everything we wanted to come out of the service, we were going to open a, everybody was going to open up a restaurant. Then on Easter Sunday, the American tanks broke into our, our barricade there and liberated everybody. But the fellows were so weak that nobody could hardly stand up. We never thought we'd ever get out, you know. But I still remember to this day of seeing two American officers coming, coming down the road with American flag. And it was one of the, even today I cry when I think about it that, you know, that we're going to be out of here. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Private Kaz Fuji was stationed at an army base in Texas. He was the only Japanese American in his outfit, 
but once the war got underway, soldiers of Japanese descent were grouped together. Well, I ended up in the 232nd Combat Engineer Company. Kaz became part of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. May 1st, 1944, we shipped out of Norfolk, Virginia, and 29 days later, we were in Naples, Italy. On June 27th, 1944, I ran over a mine. Only thing there was left of the GMC truck was the two front tires and two of the eight tires, and no axles left. Just two tires were hanging on the back. After that, I wasn't scared of nothing. I said, I'm going to make it. In months of fierce fighting, the 442 became one of the most decorated units of the war, but at a high cost. And all those dead humans and horses and whatever animal, other animals, I mean, they were strung one after another. You could not get the stench out of there. I never really came back from that war. General Doolittle's bombing raid on Tokyo was flown by pilots from Oregon's Pendleton Air Base and other bases representing every branch of the military now dotted the state. The Umatilla Ordnance Depot, sited well inland and safe from enemy attack, stockpiled every type of munition from bullets to bombs. The Tillamook Navy Air Base supported a fleet of military blimps. The blimps patrolled the coastal waters in search of enemy submarines. The Army built Camp Abbott outside of Bend at what is now Sun River. Camp White dwarfed nearby Medford in size and population. But the largest training base in the state was Camp Adair, built on what had been Benton County farmland. Camp Adair itself was interesting to watch because there was so much hubbling, bubbling where there'd never been any bubbling before. I was about 13 when, uh, when the war started. We lived in Independence. Small towns 65 years ago were extremely small towns and they were isolated. And uh, you had a movie and a couple of pool halls and that was it. All of a sudden there were all of these volunteer groups you learned to identify planes or you sat out on a a uh, stump at night and counted the airplanes that went over and you wore uniforms and the Red Cross ladies were rolling bandages and there was a lot of hyper stay busy activity that had never been there. And the Army base brought about 45,000 new neighbors almost overnight and the girls all wanted to do USO and that kind of thing. And they went out to Camp Adair on the big buses and went to dances and concerts and uh, socialized. I had never seen a black person. The bus from Camp Adair came in and a young man got off with his wife he was uh, I, on his collar. He was either a lieutenant or a captain, and I don't, I don't remember. But he was in the pinks and the uniform, just starched unmercifully. He was a big man. And I think at that time, I thought she was the prettiest thing I had ever seen. She was a tall, slender, slender lady, black, no question about it, dressed right to the teeth. but. She stayed out on the street in front of the restaurant. There was a little marquee to keep her out of the rain, and she had a, just a suitcase. He came in and got two tickets to Salem. And I told him that the bus would be about another 15 minutes, and why didn't he bring his wife in out of the rain? And he kind of turned around halfway away and looked beyond him. The place was pretty full. Farmers, loggers, 
And he just smiled and very nicely said, no, we'll be all right, thank you. They went out and they stood outside. I got home that night and I was sounding off to my mother about, looked at me like he could have damn well brought her in out of the rain. Mother said he's smarter than you are. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> Steve Bassey earned a degree in agronomy, crop science, from OSU. He dreamed of owning his own seed store, but the war detoured him into Navy Midshipman School. I had never been on a ship other than, oh, a small boat out in the ocean for, uh, to catch a salmon, and that was it. When I finished my training, I was assigned as the executive officer of a brand new LCI, the LCI 420, the Landing Craft Infantry. On June 6, 1944, he and more than 100,000 other men crossed the English Channel to what was codenamed Omaha Beach. This was D-Day. We sailed all night across the channel arriving there about 6 o'clock in the morning off of the Normandy Beach. Uh, there was a lot of uh, gunfire, a lot of noise. Well, as we went in for our first landing, uh, there were lots of beach obstacles, big uh, pronged uh, uh, obstacles planted in the sand most of them with a mine attached to them. Uh, we have tried to avoid those. We're successful in avoiding the beach obstacles. And then we uh, had a man run a line ashore because we couldn't get quite to the beach uh, to make a dry landing. And then uh, put our ramps down. The troops took off and they had the line to hang on to, to get ashore, and they were, some were some were shot before they could even get off the ramp. It was, it was quite a, quite a day. We were on Omaha Beach. Nothing but debris, and people hunkered down in the sand because they couldn't move because of both machine gun fire and uh, heavy arms. And it, it was, uh, we weren't sure whether they were going to get off or not. His ship first stormed the beach with a group of four others. The other four ships were destroyed on that initial run. But we managed to get off. Then went out about 10 miles to big transports, which had other troops aboard. And we loaded those troops onto our ship and then headed right back in and made another beaching, uh, again under pretty heavy fire. Steve's ship went on to make 12 landings. And then that night, we had a very interesting experience that night. There were two tugs that were to take barges of ammunition. Each barge had a thousand tons of open ammunition on deck. And the tugs were to take these barges in and beach them so that they had resupplies for their ammunition. The tugs hit mines and were destroyed. So they used two LCIs, ours and another one. We tied up on each one on each side of the barge, and we took those barges and went in and beached them under horrendous fire that night. And the sky was lit up. There was a lot of anti-aircraft fire. German planes were overhead, and the tracers that were just flying through the air it only take about one of those to blow up this thousand tons of ammunition. And I realized how precarious the whole thing was, not only for our ship, but this whole invasion. It was just, it was almost falling apart. 
uh, because of the heavy casualties and losing the tugs and losing other ships and my other sister ships that had gone. And, and I wondered, where are we gonna go with this? Are we gonna make it or not? And it just scared the daylights out of me. But then I pulled myself together and uh, hollered at my uh, uh, bosun to take an ax and cut the hawser. To, we were on the beach and uh, cut ourselves loose from this barge and took off. On one of our trips back out to the uh, troop transports, and I was checking to make sure everything was fine for our next beaching, and I was right beside the porthole of this big ship, and, I, and it was the galley. I looked in, and here was uh, Cook, and he was slicing off a great big piece of beautiful roast beef. And I looked and I drooled. I had, I'd been four days under nothing but K rations and we hadn't had anything really to eat. And he could see, he said, you're like a roast beef sandwich? I said, man, would I? And he said, how about your crew? And he made up a sandwich for every man of my crew. And man, I can still taste it. The Bly District of the Fremont National Forest lies between Lakeview and Klamath Falls. Late in the war, Jack Smith served as assistant ranger there. Spike the ranger and I worked timber sales all week, and then on Saturday morning, uh, we took care of the public if they had business with the Forest Service. And this uh, Saturday morning on May the 5th, 1945, uh, Jumbo Barnas pickup came in at a high rate of speed and uh, wheeled around back of the office and he ran into the office and said there's been an explosion uh, up on Gearhart Mountain, on the side of Gearhart Mountain, and there's several people hurt. The Japanese had launched thousands of bomb-carrying hydrogen balloons toward the American mainland. Many of them, like these, were shot from the sky by American planes. About 300 others did reach land, but that was kept secret from the Japanese. Almost all of the bombs exploded harmlessly, except for one. Uh, Reverend Mitchell was on the road and he just pointed that away. I don't know that he even spoke. It was obvious it was pretty serious. Uh, when we got there, uh, there were a bunch of bloody people laying there. They had apparently been grouped around this cogwheel where the explosive was located. And maybe somebody touched something, I don't know. But they fell backwards from it, just like the spokes of a wheel, almost. Five children and the minister's wife had come upon an armed balloon bomb hanging from a tree. Though too late for the people of Bly, the Japanese had already stopped sending the bombs believing that few, if any, had ever reached the U.S. I think those were the only fatalities from war action in the United States. Walt Ferris battled the Japanese as a fighter pilot. Like Carl Kostel, he served in China, one of the famed Flying Tigers. He, too, was shot down while on a mission. But unlike Carl, he did not walk out of the forest a month later. I met Walt when um, I was 16, he was 18. His family had a ranch just outside of Arlington. My mother used to write and say, you know, he's gonna make somebody a wonderful husband someday. And I'd write back and say, Mom, I hope he finds someone. <laughs> Dottie and Walt had been married only one month when he was shipped overseas. She was not told his destination, even when months later, she received the telegram. A young man brought a telegram to the house where I lived with my parents at that time and um, said they were sorry to inform you that your husband has been shot down or that he is missing in action. I had the, a letter from General Chenault saying that he had been a fine pilot and, and uh, he was just missing in action. 
the Air Force tried to get me to accept his uh, insurance and I wouldn't sign for it, which didn't make me very popular with them. But um, I kept feeling that he was coming back, that he was alive, because he always said, I'll be back. Sixteen months passed. Dottie and a friend took a short vacation to Vancouver, B.C., where one afternoon they went to tea. There was a lady going around reading tea leaves, and it was fun, you know, this is fun to do. And uh, so she came over to our table, and she read my friend's tea leaves, you know, she was going to meet some tall, dark, and handsome, and so forth. And then she picked up my cup, and she said, I see a W in your cup, and with that I boohooed. And she said, oh, what did I say? And my friend said, well, her husband is missing in action, and his name is Walt. And she put her hand on me, and she said, it's OK. This is, this is hard to say. It's OK. The W's upright. He's all right. He's alive. And we left there and went back to our hotel room and there was a wire from my dad that um, the Red Cross had sent a wire that he had been found and uh, that they were shipping him home. So that was how I found out that he was alive. My mother used to say, anybody that's good to their mother is bound to make a good husband, which he did. Eventually. <laughs> Walt Ferris was uh, my husband for 52 years till he passed away. The war in Europe ended in early May 1945. And three months later, on August 14th, Japan surrendered. I was on the boat. And everybody, I thought I was gonna, gonna be pushed into Willamette River. <laughs> Oh, yes, I remember, I remember when it was over, that was something, yes. Everybody stopped the work, ran off the boat, and just stopped celebrating. So it was nice, it was wonderful to know that it was over, that the war was over. There's more about Oregon at War on Oregon Experience Online. To learn more or to order a DVD of the show, visit opb.org. Funding for Oregon Experience is provided by the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Ann and Bill Swindell's Charitable Trust, the Oregon Cultural Trust, and from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>